three, two, one, broadcasting. Good afternoon and welcome. We'll just give it a couple of minutes to get everyone in the room and then we'll get going. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Afternoon, if you've just joined us, we're just waiting to get everyone in the room and then we'll get going. Right, I think we are ready to rock and roll. Hello and welcome everyone to this Flight Centre Travel Group webinar on the State of the Market Report and Alert Level 1 Regulations. My name is Natalia Rosa and it is a great privilege for me to spend the next hour with you and our great panellists who I'd like to introduce you to, to you before we begin. So joining us to unpack this uh, wonderful State of the Corporate Travel Report and of course, those very complicated level one regulations are Andrew Stark, who's the MD of Middle East Africa for the Flight Center Travel Group. We have Abel Alamu from uh, Ethiopian Airlines. He is the regional manager. Bonnie Smith, uh, the rose amongst the thorns. She's the GM of FCM Travel Solutions. And of course, Oz Desai, who's FCTG's corporate executive director. A very special thank you to Fourth Dimension's fantastic research team for putting the study together, which we're going to, to unpack a little bit for you today. And welcome to our panelists for joining me this afternoon at three o'clock. Before we get stuck in, the Q&A folder at the bottom of your screen is where we would love to get your questions. That Q&A folder is open for the duration of the session. So please keep those questions coming through during the webinar and we'll endeavor to respond to as many of them as we can during the hour long session. So the Q&A folder at the bottom of your screen is where you throw your questions. So I guess that uh, leads me to ask my first one. And we all know in our world of COVID that the number of seismic shifts that we have experienced in our own lives in our businesses has been absolutely monumental. I saw something the other day um, with Bill Gates being quoted as saying, two years of digital transformation have actually happened in two months. Can you believe it? Of course, that's impacted corporate travel, certainly in the short term and for the foreseeable future. Um, so I guess let's deal with the immediate question on everyone lips, everyone's lips and certainly mine. And Andrew, it's for you. With the reopening of international travel to and from South Africa, what does that mean for South Africans who are wanting to travel and are wanting to return? And what are some of the nuances around that international travel? Uh, good, good afternoon, Natalia, and thanks uh, for the opportunity. I think um, for us, we've been unpacking this as flights in a travel group and our corporate entities for the last couple of weeks, to be honest. It's great news. If you think about it, six months ago, um, our business came to a complete halt. Um, um, and where we are right now, there are pockets of green shoots. I think what's very different to any sort of global uh, disaster, where if you think about 9-11, we saw about a 31% drop in, in, in air capacity. SARS, we saw about an 18% drop in air capacity. COVID, the predictions are a 71% drop in air capacity. So I think the COVID impact is going to be felt for a very long time. It's going to have an impact on a broader group of, of the supply chain, uh, which doesn't bode well for corporate, corporate travel uh, and because it doesn't bode well for choice. So um, I think corporates uh, need to start getting their heads around the fact that there's going to be very, very much limited availability, limited choice um, around certain destinations. Uh, but the, to more to answer your question, the good, the good news is borders are open and a corporate customer can get from point A to point B um, it's going to be highly complex in some instances, but let's be let's be fair. Corporate travel has always been highly complex. We're used to delays and um, cancellations and reroutings. Um, but um, you know, it's good news. You can actually get from point A to B. I think there's there's less restrictions for corporate travel than there is for 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 leisure travel. So I think it's it's good news and it's a start. Um, certainly, I think you know President Cyril Ramaphosa's announcement 
exceeded my expectations. I initially thought he'd open up international travel for um, business essential first, but he's gone and opened up for everyone else. But obviously, a little bit, little bit more restrictions around the leisure space, far less restricted around the corporate travel management space. And as you say, there are some idiosyncrasies that we need to take into account. But because we live in a world of corporate travel, we know that travel goes awry. And that's what we're here for, is to make sure that we make it as seamless as possible for travelers. Andrew, if I could just stick to you for a second, and that's for to unpack how you feel, just based on all the discussions that you have with your global colleagues, um, with FCTG being such a global brand, about how you expect that travel to return. So what are some of the things that you're seeing in other markets, and how do you think that that will translate from an outbound South African perspective? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I mean, you know, we, we're in 11 equity countries globally. Um, we meet as an executive team every Tuesday morning for a couple of hours, and we touch base with what's happening globally. Uh, China's China's apparently, the, you know, the, 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 the virus is, is out of China. Um, I don't want to sound like Trump here, but I mean, it's out of China. Um, and uh, apparently domestic travel is thriving, you know, in the East and China. So, that's, so that really bodes well. Um, Australia and New Zealand is a bit of a world of pain uh, because um, they've tried to eradicate the virus. Um, and that hasn't certainly helped. But uh, there is Apparently, we're a couple of weeks away from borders opening up um, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, and then we look to the UK. I think they're in a world of pain. America concentrating purely on domestic travel. Uh, and then I think South Africa um, has far more um, um, probably areas of green shoots forming than the rest of our global counterparts. Our international borders op are open. Our domestic borders are open. I mean, one thing we know for sure is South Africa is open. There's pockets of Africa that are open, which would be good to hear what Abel has to say. Pockets of Indian Ocean, pockets of Far East, pockets of, of Europe. So um, from a, we sit from a South African perspective in a, probably a, a better position than most of our first world country global counterparts. So I think uh, we've got lots to celebrate. We've got lots to still unpack, which is what we'll do over the next 45 minutes. Uh, but South Africa probably looks like they're leading the pack when it comes to recovery. And I think for that is, uh, you know, being the country there, well, we've got bigger problems probably to deal with. Uh, we've got economy to move forward. And I think Cyril uh, has made as many of the right decisions as he possibly can. And I think it bodes well for, for overall business as we try and sort of get through this, this pandemic. To answer your question, two to five years before I think we're back to any real levels of normality uh, on the same numbers that we saw uh, pre-COVID. Wow, that is incredible. Um, and as you say, lots of green shoots. I'm particularly excited about Africa. So I'm going to ask Abel to unmute himself because this is aimed at him. And very excited to have you in the room with us, Abel, um, as, our, as our hub, our East Africa hub in Ethiopia is such an incredible airline and what you have done to open Africa as a hub, an Addis Ababa hub um, for the rest of the world coming into Africa. We know from an inbound perspective to South Africa that Africa, all the countries in Africa are not high risk, they're low and medium risk. We know as South Africans that we can travel everywhere in Africa without any issues, as Andrew has said. What are you seeing from an African market perspective uh, in terms of business travel recovery? Is there demand? Are people traveling? Thank you for having me, Natalia, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me for this. Uh, Africa, of course, like the other continents has been seriously affected due to the COVID restrictions over the past uh, seven months almost. So uh, we've started seeing development in terms of uh, travel movements uh, since uh, June or end of June. Some countries had relatively uh, less uh, restrict restrictions as compared to the others. Uh, with South Africa being the biggest uh, travel market in the continent, uh, when South Africa opened the borders for all African travelers last week, we can say now uh, all regions, north, south, west, and central Africa is uh, uh, ready to travel. And the Ethiopian Airlines has, has maintained the connection, uh, restoring capacities to different uh, destinations. Of course, capacities are being restored gradually. Uh, frequencies are not immediately restored. Uh, the demand is still weak. But there is a very encouraging uh, development uh, that we see on ground, particularly from West Africa to, to the parts of the Middle East and uh, a little bit to the parts of Europe as well. Uh, we believe the inter-Africa traffic uh, would definitely improve as we go forward because 
when the restrictions are lifted, uh, there are still uh, requirements by countries in terms of uh, PCR tests, in terms of uh, duration of the travel, the purpose of the travel and all those things. So with this developments going forward, uh, we will uh, see that the, the traffic, particularly from the VFR side, traffic from the uh, corporate travel side will definitely pick up in the, in the next few, few months or weeks, to, so to say. Travel is complicated, Abel, and for travel to happen seamlessly, both in the destination, or at least in the source country and the destination country, there needs to be a good understanding of what regulations are in place and the protocols that you've just outlined. Can you give us a, a perspective from an airline's point of view on how you manage all of this information and then communicate that with your travel agent partners so that they can make sure that travel is as seamless as possible? That's a very important question, Natalia. I would say that's still a very difficult uh, uh, task for all of us to do because there is no uniform procedures from uh, countries to countries. Of course, there was a platform from IATA side and advice from ICAO that every country tried to develop in terms of cards and all other regulatory procedures. But when it comes to advising the passengers, advising the suppliers and the travel agencies, uh, it's, it's a still a big challenge. But uh, from our side, what we tried to do is we created uh, a page, a dedicated page on our website, which indicates what specific countries uh, what specific requirements they have in terms of COVID test requirements, in terms of days of travel, even frequencies of the flights that are restored. And uh, digitalization is important on this. Customers need also to get this when they book their tickets directly with us or uh, with agencies, they will have to get a notification on their email advising them what kind of uh, travel requirements are they? This would be important to, to improve the experience of uh, passengers or travelers. Otherwise, uh, if someone arrives in a country without a test or without a mandatory requirement like travel insurance, then it's going to be a very difficult experience for all of us. So we, we are trying to improve this situation to maintain a completely updated information to our travelers all the time. But this has been uh, what we are doing so far. Thank you, uh, Abel. And in a COVID world, the keeper of the information has the most power because there's just so much uncertainty at the moment. So working together as an industry to make sure that we are informed is absolutely essential. Oz, I'd like to come through to you, if I may, and, and that is the TMC's role in being informed and empowered and providing information to the customer kind of on the coalface of what's happening. Can you give us an idea of how FCTG has responded to this need um, that has been highlighted in the report around TMCs providing information and empowering uh, corporate travelers to travel through good information? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely one of those things. And one of the times as, as a travel community and the travel um, agent community, it's a time to shine. So, and we saw this really as we went into lockdown and really through level five and level four when certain levels of travel was allowed. And um, really people were nervous, people were anxious and kind of getting them that information. If you think about um, people that didn't work with a travel provider, the nuances and the hoops that they had to manage and go through in order to get information was probably quite painful. Um, and, and this is something where, you know, we always say you pay a little bit, but you, you get a lot and it's when things go wrong that you want somebody to help and having somebody to support you and guide you through that was crucial. As an organization globally, uh, we invested as soon as possible with regards to getting information to customers as soon as possible. Uh, and that was through uh, our Traveler Hub, so FCTG Travel News, where we've got dynamic information from all, the world, all over the world to try and get as much up-to-date and relevant information through to our travelers and to our customers as soon as possible. We've also enabled that ability within SAM, our mobile app. So for users of SAM within Corporate Traveler and FCM, they had the ability to access that at their fingertips without having to navigate anywhere else. Uh, and it's, you know, it's the crisis response part for it. And, and now as we move into level one and we unpack in more regulations, that communication as you know, we all alluded to um, is, is gonna be even more crucial because announcement gets made and we unpack that information and try and simplify it as much as possible and pass that on to, to our customers and our travelers. Um, I'm going to bring Bonnie in here because I know Bonnie's, Bonnie, like me, loves technology. And this is why information is so exciting because technology is a great way to get, it, get the information out. 
And I can only imagine the world of pain, Bonnie, your consultants must have been in to repat people and all the rest of it. But perhaps you can speak to me a little bit about this kind of integration um, of travel advice and travel technology and how you at FCM managed to seamlessly merge the two and use it to mitigate, I think, some of the challenges that we have all experienced um, in corporate travel around COVID. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. It was interesting, actually, because as a, as a big advocate of, of technology, what I actually found through the period is that a lot of our customers wanted to turn technologies off and they wanted to have the ability to talk to the travel expert. So uh, when borders started to close down, a lot of our customers customers contacted us and said, turn off uh, travel tools. We don't want OBTs on. We don't want people making bookings. We want to be able to come through to the experts, talk to the experts, because we know that they're going to have the information at hand. Um, and I think that's what's really important about being a TMC that has a, 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 a level of both, where you've got the travel expert that you can talk to at any time, but you've also got your technology. Um, we're starting to see those technologies turn on. And I think the technology that technologies that we used uh, through the COVID period were, um, you know, I spoke about them, but around um, Traveller Hub um, and just getting and sourcing information. Uh, what really became important to, to our customers is secure, which is our duty of care. Um, our customers wanted to know where their travellers were, um, when they were coming home, how we were going to get them home, could we get them on um, repat flights, whatever we needed to do. So I think those were the technologies that probably stood out a lot. And then obviously our, our mobile app so that we could uh, send our customers seamless um, updates around what was going on. Um, so definitely a mix of both. And I think what's happened now as you've gone further down is we're starting to turn those technologies back on. Uh, companies and travelers are starting to feel confident, confident again in traveling, um, but they're still talking to their travel experts all the time. Yeah, and how long do you think that that's going to go on? You talk about it turning on, but do you think that there's going to be an element of reliance on that human face for a lot longer than, than perhaps? Yeah. Than yeah, absolutely we do. We feel it all the time. In fact, I actually got off a call with a customer just before this, um, and they've actually put a hold on going online. They've been traditional uh, a customer for a very long time. We've, we've had them for a long time at FCM, um, and they've said, let's hold off on the online until about February, March. So I think um, companies are going to wait and see what happens. They want to be able to rely on people, but that, that element of technology is still important. So it might not be the ability to do it themselves, as in the OBT, but what is important is traveler tracking, data, um, the reporting, um, and, the understand, and, and the ability to talk to customers in trip through SAM. So it's just a different type of, of technology that's important right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll talk about uh, duty of care and how policy has changed in a little bit. So I'm just going to go back to Andrew, actually, if I may. Um, and I see he's unmuted himself, so he probably wants to weigh in. But before you weigh in, Andrew, um, a question to you as someone who's a business owner, and that is, you know, talking about technology and agility in this particular time, companies that can adapt with these new business models are going to be much better positioned to get back to business. You know, there's a temptation to say, well, actually, we're on Zoom, so why, why should I travel as much as I did? And perhaps you can just unpack for me what the, the new business model in a time of COVID looks like with corporate travel as part of that and why it's important for corporate travel to be part of it. That seems like five questions, Natalia. So I'll try my best to unpack that. You can that. get so, through all of them, I'm sure. So very quickly, I think, just to bolt on what Bonnie was saying with regards to technology, and I think uh, what we pride ourselves on is the blend uh, in our offering, uh, that we have still had the human element as well as the technology capabilities, and we gave the customer choice on how they wanted to transact. And funny enough, in an environment like this where you've got, you know, your take a lots of the world and all your online capabilities really soaring um, over the last six months, it's been completely opposite in travel. The reliance back on human beings, reliance back on expertise and skill, and a key, a key attribute that comes out of the study, um, as well as the study we've seen internally as well, is how important concise con communication has been during this COVID pandemic. And I think, you know, we pride the fact that we collectively as a senior executive team spoke to our 
um, top customers, in some instances on a weekly basis, just keeping them informed on how things are going. And initially, I think when this all unfolded, when customers were really worried about the security of their travel management company, as in financial security. And I think we had to really um, you know, relay fears that we were going to be around for a long period of time. And I think that's really still quite per pertinent uh, in the environment we are today. With regards to the adaptability, um, you know, with regards to how the world's changed, I don't know about you, but I love seeing you guys on Zoom, but I physically can't wait to get on an airplane and see you down in Cape Town, Natalia. So I think there's an element. I think no doubt through, this, through the, um, the consulting uh, research that's been done, it says our corporates have saying to us, I will probably only travel 50% of what I used to travel um, in pre-COVID world. And that we accept. We think that will sort of slow down and then start ramping up probably two to three years from now. Uh, but certainly there's a role to play. I think, um, you know, in our own business, we'd be I've probably never been as collaborative as we are today with our global counterparts. We are connected on a weekly basis. I would never have had that luxury before. So I think it moved us in that direction. What I say to my team in our business is COVID has forced our 2025 plan through pushed it through to 2020. So all our 2025 strategies and initiatives have really been fast forwarded by five years, and that includes the adoption of technology. So no doubt, I think I think there is certainly still a critical need around getting on airplanes, um, getting into destinations, and really pushing the flesh with your supplier, your customer. And the one thing that no one really unpacks right now is the, the lost emotional intelligence on a Zoom call versus the human element face to face. Um, and companies that you know I sort of read about all talk about what happens in the induction period, what happens when I'm bringing people on board, what happens to their culture. And I think culture and connectivity and communication is really, really key for most companies. Company like Flats and a Travel Group, we thrive on the collaboration, we thrive on the culture. And, and that's something we got to certainly unpack. So I th certainly feel there will be there will be um, a heightened demand as the complexity starts to weigh down uh, for travel again. Um, what's the new the new the new norm for travel, Natalia? Um, I think we've got to get used to probably a world and able my jump in here, but a world where we've got to get used to masks, hand sanitization, and probably a, a far more um, cleaner world than what we live in. Uh, I think really what disrupts travel are the um, protocols around quarantine, uh, the protocols or protocols around testing. I mean, testing we could probably live with, but you know, I'd call them archaic. Um, um, design around a quarantine measures are a hindrance uh, to anyone getting on an airplane unless it's essential travel. So I think that will slowly unpack and airlines will certainly be forcing governments to make better decisions around that. And we've got to also be mindful that a lot of governments around the world are not in the world of travel and tourism, both inbound and outbound. And in all due respect, they don't understand the complexities that come with it. So more than ever, um, you know, partnering up with reputable travel companies, reputable supply chain, as in, you know, our airlines and our hotels. Um, we're going to see consolidation. Um, IATA predicts uh, 23 airlines will collapse over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and what does that mean? So I think supply chain is going to be very important. Your network and the types of partners corporates are prepared to partner with for their financial security. Again, uh, really, really important as well. You see, you managed to answer all five questions. Next time I'm giving you 10, right. Abel, uh, let's talk about that uh, airline, passenger airline experience. And I don't think people understand how seamless it is and how much work you have done as the airlines to ensure that it is safe, that it is easy. Talk us through that passenger experience. What can we expect as a passenger? Um, Andrew mentioned it. Similar to the, the change instituted in the industry following the 9-11 attack on security issues, COVID definitely left us with a lot of uh, development in terms of uh, uh, biosecurity and biosafety. I think those are the two words that uh, airlines and airports are currently building their strategies because uh, travelers need to be assured whenever they travel, uh, airports are not a high risk zone or uh, aircrafts are not the problem in that aspect. 
So airlines are more or less developing a contactless experience uh, as much as possible, including from the transaction of the ticket, booking the ticket, which is already on place, but minimizing the, the experience at the airport that uh, someone has to interact with any service provider at the airport. So the check-in process, obviously, needs to completely go into an online checking on mobile checking technology definitely comes in this to to assist the overall experience and the boarding process as well uh, mostly in the past uh, there was a development as you see airlines have 40 50 percent of uh, experiences but now they are going more into into uh, creating a system to minimize the passenger experience. So digitalization and technology would definitely come in this aspect to assist the passengers. Uh, on top of that, uh, hubs, particularly hubs, where a lot of passengers would transact or would travel at a given time would be important. Airports with limited infrastructures would definitely have a challenge because passengers would not feel safe uh, to, to use those kinds of hubs. And uh, luckily, Ethiopian Airlines has been uh, developing and then doing a lot of upgrades at Bali International Airport, which is now uh, the largest hub in terms of passenger traffic when it comes to a gateway into, into Africa. And the, the airport is now reorganized in terms of uh, a completely uh, uh, assuring way to a passenger from the biosafety and biosecurity perspective. It's pretty much spacious. Uh, no one will be congested like it used to be. And this airport has just started two, 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 two weeks ago, luckily for us. So we are ready to channel the traffic that is coming in during the revamping strategy going forward. But on top of it, the last would be maybe uh, whatever uh, pr precautions are there, there will still be uh, an exposure to a passenger or to a traveler at airports or within the aircraft or anywhere. But airlines are now coming up with a solution to ensure passengers whenever they travel, if they come uh, with some kind of infection issues, the medical cost is going to be covered. So Ethiopian Airlines also has started uh, an insurance policy for any traveler when traveling on Ethiopian Airlines. If they contracted or uh, got the virus, then the medical expenses will be covered. The repatriation cost, if they have to go to their place of origin, will also be covered. So both the physical infrastructure, the technology will enable it. And on top of that, if there is any loop, then the, the customer experience needs to be supported through different type of uh, customer strategies like the insurance so that travel would be seamless again and uh, passengers will return back quickly. Oz, uh, if I may just um, lean on you for this particular question and it is around, uh, I guess, the selection of supplier based on health and hygiene safety protocols. So I know the report said that 20% of respondents who did not have a travel policy prior to COVID now have an interim policy in place. To what extent are those travel policy priorities uh, linked to health and hygiene and, and safety, if you will? Absolutely. So Abel, I'm definitely going to steal the biosecurity and biosafety line. Uh, I think it's a great, great soundbite. So I'm definitely going to use that at some point. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, um, companies not having travel policies within the, the startup to mid-market kind of spend or SME kind of spend travel is not uncommon. What happens is it, get wrapped, it gets wrapped up in some shape or form in the expense policy, and it gives you an expense guideline on how much you can spend around travel. Whilst where you might find in larger organizations where travel is probably a little bit more significant, there's more rigid guidelines around health and safety. What COVID has done is actually flipped that. It's prioritized health and safety uh, for, for pretty much every organization. So even if they didn't articulate it in the past, they have included that. So things like what will their people experience, things like PPE, so will Will they be expected to provide the PPE like masks and sanitizers when their people are traveling and that part of the expense policy? Or you know, will, will they be able to claim it back? Those kind of nuances. What we also saw was definitely a lot more vetting. So especially when there was no airlift at the start around cars and the safety and people felt a lot more safe with car hire than flying. And we've seen that change now over the last few months. People again have got that confidence and allowing their, their travelers to get into airplanes again. The other thing that has changed is the, the period or the, how long the trips are. So people are a bit more understanding that it might take an extra day because of limited 
airline schedules with regards to um, you know, connectivity. Some trips might become longer, and especially with international opening up, we're starting to see companies think through what those policies look like on international travel, uh, especially when they're in destination to come back to get those tests, especially with, with critical travel. Uh, and then the last one is just uh, the, the per diem and the cost of trips. So there, there is an inclination and understanding that trips will be a little bit longer. You want to have better selection. So you might, instead of staying in a guest house, which you stayed historically, uh, you might feel, your travelers might feel more confident going into an international brand or an African brand or South African brand uh, hotel. Uh, so those kind of things, which might cost a little bit more, but companies are willing to do that. Um, and definitely with that comes the cost of the trip and the ROI part of it. But there is a little bit more flexibility and also, you know, things like uh, people might not be as comfortable historically. We've we've schmoozed our clients and taken them to nice restaurants. Our customers might not want to do that, and I might not be as comfortable going to a restaurant. So I might allow Uber Eats, which might be a little bit more from a per diem expense with food uh, and utility, so to speak, when I'm traveling. So those are the main nuances that we have seen. Or if people didn't have that articulated within the policy, they've added that as part of an interim policy. Mm. And so I, I do remember the report talking about um, the fact that policy changes addressing COVID-19 precautions were seen by those who responded as an important way to restore confidence in the overall workplace. So almost like a framework that provided that confidence. What in your view is needed to restore that um, travel confidence, if you will? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a question our customers have been asking us for, and we've, we've done a few things around it. So the first part is actually understanding as an organization what your appetite is to travel. So from an executive level, uh, you know, operational need, business strategy, is travel going to need it in a way it's going to be needed? The next part is actually speaking to your travelers. So, you know, it's all good and well to make assumptions on behalf of them, but they are the guys that are actually your road warriors that have to do the work and get into that aircraft and be away from their families. So really just speaking to them. And with that, what we created was a quick, you know, five, seven questionnaire, uh, question questionnaire uh, for, for our customers to actually speak to their travelers, consolidate that information. The next part of it is actually as a business to what I alluded to earlier is what are the things that we are willing to change and adapt to ensure we meet the needs of our travelers from a health and safety perspective, but also their overall concerns to make them feel a little bit more comfortable while they are traveling. And what you do, what you can do after that is actually do a post trip survey. So whether it's again, a quick call, a quick survey, four or five questions, how did the trip go? How did you find things? Was the hotel fine? Did you feel safe? Did we cover the needs around that? Uh, and, and to do that, we, we, we have developed these toolkits that are available on corporate traveler.co.za, uh, the business travel toolkit and, and the surveys are, and the questionnaires are on there. So it's really equipping our customers with ways to guide these conversations within their organizations to build that confidence. As an industry, I think we publish as much as possible. We have forums like this to answer the questions of our customers and build that confidence and try and make it as simple as possible to digest the information that's out there. Um, and, and people are willing to travel. They just want to make sure that they're supported and they know who to contact if something goes wrong within their own organization and, of course, their travel company. And there's a so lot of information out there. Yes, Andrew. Can, can I bolt on there with, with, with Oz as well? And it might be controversial here, but I think, unfortunately, the travel and tourism um, industry, aviation industry, uh, seems to be, you know, be blamed for COVID. You know, if you think about it, we've got 16,000 passenger jets that are grounded. Um, that's a fair number. Um, and, and, you know, the, the travel and tourism industry wasn't the one that started, started, started COVID. And I think what we've got to do is I think we've got to be practical about this and say, well, how do we get, and I think uh, road warriors as uses a good analogy, how do we get road warriors getting out there and actually saying it's okay to travel again? Uh, it's as, as good as form of, of public transport per se, uh, as long as the standard, standard protocols are in place. I think for me, the two really important, how do you bring back um, that that level of um, the feeling feeling safe about the journey is duty of care as well. Our customers are saying to us, we want to make sure the duty of care protocols are well in place. Make sure that you partnering with the very best partners, um, and make sure that if something goes wrong, you can repatriate my 
uh, employee out of a country or to the safest area possible within a couple of hours. And I want to know at any given time where my travelers are. And I think that's priority number one. And I think priority number two, we were talking about travel policy is I actually don't see it as a travel policy anymore. It's an insurance policy. It's a travel insurance policy. It's some of those things that in the leisure space, we talk about the fact that you should never leave South African borders without travel insurance. And same in the corporate space today. If you do not have a travel policy in place, you should have a travel policy in place because that gives everyone the guidelines on how they need to operate within a travel spectrum. Um, so a couple that was duty of care, um, you know, I think, we, yeah, we just got to be practical around this is that um, it, it should start to spike in time. Uh, and I suppose collectively as an industry, we've been battered um, and we've got to slowly build up that, uh, that self-belief again that, um, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And you mentioned the, the magic words, duty of care. So I'm going to go on to Bon because I know we used to speak about duty of care almost as much as we say you're on mute at the moment. I guess that has become the topic of discussion. How are you finding travel programs changing practically um, to cater to this additional need for duty of care, if you will, or yeah. focus on it? Yeah, there's nothing like a global pandemic for customers to sit back and say, hang on a second, what does my travel policy actually say? And what am I not uh, allowed to do? And I think some of the things, we're seeing a massive demand for, for customers talking to us around policies of the future. Um, and, I, and I love that what Andrew spoke about being insurance. It's, it's absolutely that. And you shouldn't be traveling if you don't have a policy in place. Um, and I think there's, we, we, we're still unpacking many aspects of it, of, of what this looks like. Um, to Abel's point, a big thing on customers' mind is around touchless travel. So how do, they, how do we make sure that within the policy, our, our, our travelers feel safe, that when they get to the airport, it is all bio, I love it, biosecurity, bio, bio safety, biometrics is gonna be a key part. Digital health documents, um, which comes a big part of, of what is the technology of travel start to look like and how do we make sure that we have got technologies that allow our customers to store everything digitally instead of having pieces of paper. Um, I think a big aspect of, of um, change of policy is what happens if I get the virus while I'm traveling? How do I get home? How, where, where do I quarantine? So, so that's being unpacked at the moment. And then absolutely the duty of care. And I think that element has probably um, been driven the most o over the, this period. And, you know, we do have um, a, a, a system called Secure where we can track travelers. And I think really what's happened is from a technology point of view, uh, the group has not stopped the investment on duty of care. And if anything, we've been able to enhance that for our, our, our customers and our travelers. So um, the, the survey repeatedly stressed the challenge of um, respondents that they needed to be informed and we've spoken about information and that this information is changing very quickly all the time. Um, you've got these dedicated COVID-19 dashboards, is that right? Can you unpack that a little bit? What, what do those dashboards do? How do I benefit as a customer? Yeah, so um, you can get into the, the into our dashboards and understand exactly what the rules of entering any country um, is. You can make sure that you know when um, you're getting on an aircraft what you have to have um, in your hands, what checks you've got to have at hand, and then from that we're able to and and. But we use it both internally and externally in Italia. So that's been a benefit. We're all, you know, it doesn't matter if you come through to our travel export, if you're doing it yourself, we've actually got the same source of information. Um, and it's really um, helped us gather the information and make sure that we're giving our current the most, giving our customers the most accurate and updated information when it comes to, to moving out of um, borders and into uh, the big thing that we saw in FCM actually. So travel didn't stop in FCM. Um, actually through the COVID period. And what we actually saw is that customers were uh, doing land arrangements a lot. So car hire, let me get in a car and travel. Um, and if I am gonna get into the car and travel down to different um, destinations, um, and I know that it's marked just me in the car and stuff, what documents do I need? And that was all at their fingertips through, through the travel hub. 
Fantastic. I did paste the um, Travel Hub link in a little bit earlier. I'll paste it in again so that you guys have got access to it and you can have a look at it. Um, Oz, travel approval. Now, I know in South Africa, you used to have to jump through 17 hoops anyway for that to happen. I anticipate in a world of COVID that has become worse. Tell me how things have changed. Yeah, so yeah, you 100% on the money there. You know, South African travelers are used to approvals, whether it's at least one or two approvals, even for basic uh, domestic trip. Um, so that that ha hasn't changed. I think where, where the changes come around approvals is there might be an additional layer. So while, where historically you needed one, you now need a second signature. We've also seen um, very much around the... Um, the reason for travel. So the business unit has to have a defined reason for travel, which the EXCO, for example, will sign off on. And then the EXCO member, for example, will need to sign, sign that off. And again, this, this really varies by organization. So you know there are certain organizations and companies that they cannot physically function without travel. Uh, you know, say if you are a mining company, if you have technicians on the road, those kind of things. So those were probably a little bit more flexible and, and they, they, they expanded on it from a health and safety perspective. But definitely for, for the guys that are trying to mitigate costs and it's not holistically within their strategy, they've added additional layers, one from a cost perspective, but two really from a health and safety perspective, do, do those individuals really need to be out? What we are seeing now is that's starting to loosen up a little bit because people are a little bit more confident around travel. So that's slowly getting a little bit better. Andrew, if uh, I may... Uh speak to you about the TMC's role in navigating all of these different industries and their requirements. The art of travel consulting became, it was complicated before, it's become very complicated in a COVID world um, with the airlines changing of rules, cancellation and refunds, five months on, it's still quite fluid and changing. How do you feel that the travel consultant's role is going to stay different in a time of COVID and beyond? Uh, I think indefinitely, um, you know, if it's going to take two to five years for the industry to recover to, you know, sort of any, you know, sort of levels that we've seen before, uh, less, less supply chain in market, less choice, um, less availability with reroutings and, and so on and so forth. I think, um, you know, sort of it's extended the, um, the need uh, for, you know, sort of and, uh, the hybrid model of saying, you know, if I want to still deal with a human being, be a you know, tr traditional travel management company, you and me, I have that. If I want to use state-of-the-art online booking tools, which we have as well, I can use that as well. So it's a hybrid on where the, the traveler or the travel booker, and I think the travel booker, yeah, I'd hate to be in a travel booker's position as well. Can you imagine managing, um, you know, that portfolio? Because again, you know, that's probably, um, you know, you rely on us in, in many instances. So I think, you know, it's relying on the travel book and making sure that the communication's open. Uh, and, you know, probably more to answer your question on it is, is yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the, the need for the dedicated travel management company or the corporate travel management company is yet to look after your needs as a tra for, for, from a travel perspective is certainly real. And I don't, I certainly see that, you know, going up in the hierarchy of needs when it comes to um, sort of uh, corporate procurement, uh, no doubt. You mentioned uh, travel bookers uh, and the world of pain they've also experienced. Uh, Bonnie, could you perhaps elaborate how you have empowered those travel procurement teams to make informed program decisions uh, from shutdown and now all of this kind of moving situation? What are you doing to help them? Yeah, good question. And I think from shutdown, I think what we did early on is we engaged with customers pretty quickly. Um, and uh, things, like I mentioned earlier, we, we turned off booking tools, we made the travel experts the, the key person in their travel program for anything that they needed, and I think that's worked really well. Um, I think Andrew mentioned it earlier, but we communicated with our customers all the way through. Um, anything that happened, anything that was new, we made sure that we, we went out with communication, we've spoken to our customers, and then from a, a key account management team, I, th I think they've actually been busier than they've ever been before. And that's really been driven around what do policies look like, change in policies, um, traveler tracking, um, consolidation of suppliers, because that's really important. Um, I think another key aspect for our, our corporate customers is that they've got 
corporate deals with, with suppliers and airlines and what happens when all of a sudden those deals um, tiers aren't met. Um, and, you know, we've made sure that we are, have been the forefront of that conversation with the supplier by extending that program out with, with no impact to the customer. So I think it's been a number of things, but I think for me, the number one um, priority was around communication. And the reason why a customer brings on a, a TMC to manage their travel program is because they expect us to be the experts um, and they expect us to keep our, our travelers safe. And I think in a crisis, um, that's what we've had to show our customers that we can do. And I think that communication piece was probably the key element um, in engaging with the customers, keeping them on board and keeping them up to date with information. You did mention uh, travel consolidation, um, and I know that in the report that came out as a reliable way to maintain oversight of all bookings, to tighten that approval process, uh, make sure that the suppliers that you're contracting with are safe suppliers, essentially. What are the benefits of working with a global TMC like you when, when you're talking about consolidation? Well, that's exactly what we do, Natalia. So we know how to work with our suppliers. We know which suppliers are, are, are going through their own consolidation processes. We talk to them around their safety um, um, requirements. Um, we make sure that we are talking globally with um, our global counterparts around airlines. Uh, again, Andrew mentioned earlier that our ATA put forward that very scary statistic that, that 24, 27 airlines wouldn't make it through. That's a worrying piece of information for customers. And I think when you partner with a TMC that's got um, equity in 11 countries, and we're seeing that through, um, we're seeing what's happening in those 11 countries with our own national carriers, um, uh, big supplier chains, and we're able to feed that information back to our customers, they can make really good um, concrete decisions on how they consolidate their travel program. And I think, you know, you, you got, uh, customers got comfortable with travel, you know, it was, it was easy to do, more airlines are born, oh, I'll just fly that airline, and then all of a sudden, actually, hang on, I've put my Travelers on an airline that's only been around a few years and we're not sure if they're actually going to make it to the other end of a, of, a, of a massive crisis like this. And so that consolidation starts to become really important and we want to make sure that we are putting our spend into suppliers that are going to get through this on the other end. I'm going to ask one last question around uh, the, the study and Oz, I'm going to ask it to you and I'm going to just say if you would like to ask any questions around the level one regulations, we do have a couple uh, that have come in, we're happy to respond to those, please feel free to throw those into the Q&A for us. Oz, a final question around the report for you and that is around travel budgets. Of course, the first thing people are going to want to do is to say, right, rein it in completely. How can a TMC help companies navigate the significant drop of uh, travel budget that they're now faced with, essentially? Yeah, so I, I hope I hope our CFO is listening because um, you know he he holds the the purse strings in our business. Um, but yeah, I think you know it's it's definitely something that everybody's looking to do. You've got to stabilize your organizations as many of the companies within South Africa and Africa have done to, to kind of get to where they are. And we're probably at a point where everybody's defining strategy. We know historically, we know economically, the data says to us that travel is an enabler for business growth and business optimization. So any company, whether you're a startup, whether you are a Forbes, uh, you know, a JSC listed company, whether you are a globally listed company, the expectation is growth. Um, and, and, and aggressive growth generally, especially through this. Travel is that enabler of that. It allows you to connect. It allows you to mobilize your, 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 your business. Uh, we saw from the study, the first parts that every organization, the highest ranked people that need to travel are going to be our salespeople and account management people. And those are the people that are customer facing and they're the primary drivers for growth with an organization and retention, which ensures growth happens and there's no leaky bucket. So I don't see that changing. The other part is about connectivity. You know, Andrew mentioned culturally, uh, we cannot physically do a, a great workshop with 20 people with sticky notes or agile workshop via a, a Zoom or any digital platform. No one has that capability right now. So that ability will, oh, I still here. Um, that need will always be there. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got a way of what's business critical um, and, and really what's going to drive growth. And all CFOs and procurement need to consider that uh, as we kind of venture onto this new environment. 
Okay, I'm going to segue to our level one questions. I'm almost a little bit scared to go down this rabbit hole, but let's go anyway. Uh, and the question is from Tsetso who says, uh, there's two questions. The one I can actually respond to quite easily, but the first one I'm hoping one of our panelists will. And uh, the questions are, do treaty permit holders have to apply to return to South Africa through the Department of Home Affairs? The second question is, what is the expected response time from the DHA on these travel approval requests? So the second question I can respond to quite easily, the DHA has come back to us and said they don't know. So the DHA does not know how long it's going to take for them to um, approve the requests for business travelers coming from high risk countries. Also to note that that list of high risk countries will change fortnightly. So if you are the UK and you are on the high risk today, you might not be on the high risk in two weeks time when you want to travel. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Would any of our panelists like to deal with the first question, which is around treaty permit holders applying to return to South Africa? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've come across that one just quite yet. Um, so, you know, my recommendation would be to, to contact your, your travel experts and we can do that research to give you as concise information as possible, uh, you know, to the various channels. Um, I'd rather not give you the incorrect information. I'd rather give you stuff that we 100% show off. So please send it through to one of our experts and we'll review that for you. Great. Nicole has said, if you arrive back in South Africa with a negative test, will you be allowed to self-quarantine at home or will you be forced into a facility? And then her second part to that is, if you land in Joburg, will you have to get another test done before you can fly in Cape Town? I'm happy to respond to that unless you want to respond, Oz. Okay, so Nicole, to your first question, it depends on who's arriving in South Africa. If it is a South African citizen, they don't even need to arrive with a PCR test. The government does ask within its regulations that you present a test, but as a South African citizen or a permanent resident holder, you are entitled to be in South Africa. So they cannot bar your entry. The airline on boarding is quite likely able, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, going to ask you for a PCR negative test. But if you are a South African, you cannot be denied entry into the Republic of South African. So you will not even need to self quarantine at home as a South African, you are entitled to come home. You will be screened like any traveler. If you are shown to be symptomatic, then yes, you will be required to isolate. There is no need to get another test before you fly to Cape Town. Your test is solid, the one that you've already done. Um, that is the response to, to those questions. Uh, let's see if we have any other level one questions. Travel insurance. So do South Africans need travel insurance to return to South Africa? Anyone want to take that? Um, Natalia, no, I think the answer is no to return. Um, it's more, you know, outbound travel. Um, you know, obviously we, uh, we certainly uh, push the fact that you should be taking travel insurance whenever you leave South African borders. That should be non-negotiable, especially in these times. But uh, from our understanding, no, South Africans will not be required to show travel insurance when coming back into the country. Fantastic. Yes, if I may... If I may come in here, uh, as, as uh, rightly said, South African citizens are not subjected to the current restriction the government put forward. So they don't need a PCR test and they don't also need uh, uh, an insurance to come back to their own country. Airlines will also board them without checking this from their point of origin. Wonderful, thank you, Abel. The world is our oyster as South Africans. And a question we often get, uh, whether it's leisure or corporate travel, is that South Africans can travel to anywhere in the world provided that recipient country or destination is happy to have them. So there is no limitation in terms of high risk, if you will, from a South African government perspective to have South Africans travel for business or leisure to anywhere in the world provided that destination country is happy to have them. And that's the important thing to check with your travel consultant and what requirements there are um, in that destination country. Brett has said, will travel insurance providers cover the cost of the COVID test if this has to be done in a foreign destination or for, before they depart back to South Africa? So the travel insurer in South Africa, would they cover that? No. No, it's not part of the insurance policy. No. Yeah. Short and sweet. Okay. I was going to say, Natalia, um, able to answer that question, just like a true partner in South African Airways. 
<laughs> Come again, Andrew. I said, you answered that question uh, like a true partner in South African Airways. I'm sure that's why we've got hundreds of people on this call. They all want to hear from you. Yeah. You know, we are a very true partner with South African Airways. Uh, we have a very good relationship over the years, and we would like to take it further from where it is, it is now. So we, we, we're working on it. We would like to support wherever we can. You're on the record, hey, Abel. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> no, well, Natalia, and I don't mean to take over as a facilitator, but I think it is such a pertinent point for us. I think, you know, we sit as a travel company in South Africa, we talk about supply chain and, you know, we, we worry, we worried about what's left. You know, I think if you look at the local market, Flas FA is doing very well, SA Air Link's doing very well. There's a big question mark around Mango now. There's obviously a question mark around SAA. Uh, the quick question mark around the 10 billion. And I think, you know, what's going to happen will, will be really interesting to see. I think for us, you know, a lot of our customers are manufacturing, engineering, um, mining, um, and we rely heavily on a, um, a sort of a connected uh, African network. Um, so for us, uh, it's, it's important that we know what's going to happen. And I, you talk about that question earlier, Natalia, about what's going to get trust back in travelers getting on board aircrafts is they're getting back on aircrafts uh, on carriers uh, that are reputable uh, and obviously have the network. So I think, uh, you know, I think some, I think Oz or Bonnie mentioned as well, is that what's going to drive GDP growth is airlift. And we've always advocated this, you know, open the skies, which takes away a lot of this noise. If we did have open skies, which is another topic for conversation. Um, but, um, you know, so, yeah, I think it's, it is a very pertinent point. And I think, you know, that's certainly why on this call, yeah, we partnered with um, you know, Ethiopian and Able uh, to maybe provide some clarity on what does the African network look like? Um, air network going to look like over the next sort of 12 to 18 months, if I may. Okay. Uh, as you know, Ethiopian Airlines is one of the leading carriers currently. Before COVID, uh, we had about uh, 130 destinations all over the world. Uh, from Tokyo to Los Angeles, from Oslo to uh, Cape Town and uh, everywhere in between. And Africa has always been our backyard market. We had 62 destinations in the continent and post COVID, we managed to recover some 40 of the destinations now that ET is currently flying. And uh, ET is ready to restore all the capacity and expand the operation into these places. Uh, we are ready in terms of uh, aircrafts. We have 125 aircrafts, brand new Boeing and Airbus A350s. The facilities, as I mentioned, at this airport has, has been upgraded to accommodate the increasing passenger traffic. So the inter-Africa connectivity is uh, currently pretty much on the strong side. And we also have a lot of strategic partners in the continent in different parts of like in West and Central and East Africa. So working with this startup airlines as well, uh, Ethiopian Airlines has committed to, to contribute to a revamp strategy of each African countries in terms of returning leisure traffic because tourism, particularly in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, is very much crucial. So we would like to bring tourists who are ready to come back to Africa and visit. We would like to make it easy for them and commerce is also quite important. So ET is restoring this capacity. As far as South Africa is concerned, this is a very big market uh, that Ethiopian Airlines is also has a vested interest in. We restored the capacity with a daily flight uh, to Johannesburg on the 1st of uh, October. And by the 20th of October, we will do our second daily flight, which is a night connection, which makes uh, it very much easy to travelers, particularly within the continent, because passengers will have uh, a minimum uh, time in Addis, which is pretty much critical at this time. So Cape Town is also connected in our network. Uh, just to go back to your question, South African Airways has been our partner for a very long time. We have a co-chair arrangement. We have interline agreements. Uh, all these arrangements are currently in place. So anyone booking even with SA can also travel with Ethiopian Airlines during this time so that we can make it easy for all travelers to fly confidently. Thank you, Abel. Um, I'm going to stay with Abel, if I may, because you're popular on our Q&A uh, folder. And that's a question from Rian saying, do you foresee airline tickets going up with the opening of borders for certain countries? Or will you try to re retain the same fares? 
I think uh, we would pretty much stay on the same fares because uh, most airlines who come to different operation are restoring capacity, meaning demand is still weak, but the available capacity is high. So it's a basic economics. Airlines will still keep the same fare, but uh, it might be minimal increase here and there, uh, particularly segment wise or destination basis. But we do not expect a significant spike of uh, fares uh, like people projected. Right, we are on four o'clock. I'm conscious that everybody's time is very precious. So I'm going to um, ask one last question if I may, I'm being sneaky, Andrew. Um, and that is the question around um, how do you foresee a collaboration happening going forward? So it's very important that countries, government bodies, companies, airlines, TMCs collaborate better in a COVID post COVID world. What does that look like? You have the final say, and then we will say goodbye. Ooh, uh, look, I think, you know, I think COVID's taught us to collaborate more. Um, uh, we're certainly gonna have a smaller market uh, from an, a South African outbound perspective, a smaller market, less players, high level of consolidation. Um, and I think we all need each other. Um, and I don't think the travel and tourism sector, the aviation sectors, immune compared to the rest of business South Africa. You know, I think uh, more than ever, we probably want to buy local, we want to, you know, sort of work together and we want to collectively try and find any green shoots. A good example of that, if I may, just very quickly on leisure, you know, our flight centre brand, um, you know, we've, we've really concentrated on the homegrown holiday um, um, aspect of our business. And, you know, for the first time ever, heavily invested in the domestic sector. Um, and I think it's good news, you know, I think South Africans, uh, you know, you need to go for pockets where you get more bang for your buck. Uh, and I think it's going to be a slow rehabilitation until we grow up. And I think we all need each other uh, to sort of, uh, to, to, to make sure we all collectively grow. So I think collaboration is a fate to complete. And if you're not collaborating, if you have been collaborating, you better start collaborating, I think, uh, in order to collectively uh, see ourselves out of this. Good message to end our webinar on. And uh, those that have posted questions we haven't responded to, don't worry, the Flight Center Travel Group team have got your questions and will respond to them, I'm sure. Uh, and my thanks to our panelists, Bonnie, Oz, Abel, and Andrew for spending the last hour with us. And to everyone who attended, we thank you for your time and for your insights and for your support. May you have a wonderful afternoon and a great week ahead. Cheers, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, thanks. Bye, guys.